again welcome Terry Eagleton to Notre Dame, where his semi-annual public lectures offer me the pleasure of pointing out that in a profession where a literary critic's admirers are most likely to be other specialists, Eagleton is actually read by the public and discussed in The Guardian and The New York Times to say nothing of at faculty cocktail parties and perhaps even in undergraduate dorms. Small wonder that he's been called our most influential living critic. His work is notable for an uncommon degree of clarity, wit, and audacity. He's deployed that audacity for especially good effect in recent years, as he's also reminded us what it means to have a capacious understanding of religious faith and leftist politics. Following his first book, The New Left Church, he's published scores of works on aesthetics, sexuality, postmodernism. He hasn't limited himself to criticism, however. He's also published a novel, a play, a memoir, and though he informed his Notre Dame audience last spring that he is the last human on the planet to do without email, <laughs> he has even written a film script. The very titles of recent books give a taste of what Marina Warner has called his sparkling effrontery and include Why Marx Was Right, On Evil, and Yes, The Meaning of Life. Published this year by Norton is Across the Pond, An Englishman's View of America, which includes the typically Eagletonian observation that our Americans are concerned about sin, the British about bad manners. <laughs> also out this year from Yale University Press is How to Read Literature and he will tell us today how to read animals. His lecture is entitled, The Body as Language, or Do Badgers Have Souls? Please join me in welcoming Terry Eagleton back to Notre Dame. Well, I'd like to see, you hear that? Yeah. I'd like to see so many badger lovers <laughs> fact, I'm thinking of starting a society called Blonde, uh, Badger Lovers of Notre Dame. Uh, you could have regular meetings and exchange photographs of badgers, perhaps. Even dress up in badger costume and frolic around a little, you know, chase each other around the room. All kinds of enticing possibilities. Um, if badgers do have souls, how would we know? Or if they don't, how would we know? Well, one might be worse than say, look at them. Do I mean peer into their soulful brown little eyes, or perhaps soulless brown little eyes, as the case may be? No, I mean, I mean, look at what they get up to. Look at what they do. Um, Wittgenstein remarks in Philosophical Investigations that if you want an image of the soul, he says, look at the body. Um, he means, I assume, um, not the body as a anatomist <coughs> might see it, not the body as a material object, the living body, the body in action, the body as practice, the body as, as project. A lot of philosophical problems look different <coughs> when one thinks of the self as an agent, primarily, in the way that Marx and Heidegger both do in their different ways, rather as a self of the form of practice, the form of project, rather than the self as the recipient of sensations or uh, gazing out contemplatively upon a world of objects that it wonders, well, wondering whether they really exist, as opposed, let's say, to the laboring subject who actually knows it's brought those objects into existence and therefore has a different kind, a more practical relationship to them. Um, Practice constitutes the life of the body, uh, rather in a sense you might say that meaning constitutes the life of the sign. And meaning for Wittgenstein, of course, is an activity, not a mental event, not a mental process. It's something people socially get up to. Um, as the bodies, as material objects, the ultimate objectification of the body um, is known as death, though it's notable that Thomas Aquinas refuses to use the word body or corpse. He speaks instead of the remains 
of a human body, as we sometimes do ourselves today. It's just part of the damage inflicted by a Cartesian tradition, I suppose, that when we hear the phrase, the body in the library, the last thing we think of is an assiduous reader. <laughs> in a long, tedious tradition of mechanistic materialism, the word body generally means a dead one. Bodies as material objects not greatly the fashion <coughs> in these dogmatically culturalist days. Even so, I think it's worth pointing out that whatever else human beings are, they are in the first place natural objects, lumps of matter, some of us more lumpy than others, and that anything more sexy or glamorous that we can get up to has to get up, we got up to within this given constraining context. It's true that the body has a certain kind of priority over other natural material objects because it's what organizes them into significant projects, so it has a kind of privilege or priority over them, but that doesn't mean to say it can't be reckoned up among those objects, whereas God, of course, can't be reckoned up among the objects he creates. God and the universe don't make two. And if men and women are more than just parcels of matter, um, uh, it's not because they harbour within themselves a mysterious or invisible entity called the soul, but because they are parcels of matter of a peculiarly active, self-organising, highly particular kind. And this, in fact, is exactly what soul language has traditionally been trying to account for. The problem with most materialists is not that they overlook something called the soul, but they don't have a sufficiently subtle understanding of matter, of the body, and that comes, those two things come to exactly the same thing. Like Aristotle, Wittgenstein regards the soul as the form of the body, as its animated principle or uniquely particular mode of self-organization. And this is not especially a mysterious affair. It's perfectly open to view. You can see somebody else's soul all the time, just as you can see their rage or their grief. It's not, I think, particularly helpful to speak of our emotions as being inside us, we tend to think, and therefore invisible. I mean, howling, snarling, or emptying precious bottles of scotch over our people's heads isn't an internal affair. Um, emptying bottles of scotch over people's heads, of course, is a deeply unwise practice, not because it causes them discomfort, but because it's a terrible waste of effort. <laughs> in these situations, our consciousness, really by turn, no doubt, our consciousness is inscribed on our bodies rather as the meaning is present in a word. It's true, of course, that we can conceal what we're feeling, conceal our emotions, um, but that's a complex social practice that takes some learning, and that can only go on to learning, to about concealment or deception or dissembling or mystifications, can only go on within a social context. We have to learn that just as we have to learn how to lie. Wittgenstein once remarked that a dog cannot lie, but neither can he be sincere. And that's probably true of a badger as well. <laughs> um, why can't badgers conceal their emotions? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe they do. It could be they're uh, really excited about nuclear physics, but currently <laughs> dissembling the fact from it. You know. Well, why can't they conceal their feelings? It might be enough to say it might be because they don't have language, because they don't have the conceptual medium in which we learn how to conceal our feelings, in which we learn the practice of concealing our feelings, and so on. We can see that Hoover's and Pat Sands don't have circles. <coughs> simply by looking at what they do, or rather, at what they don't do. We don't need to peer into their innards to establish this fact. Uh, if you claim that they don't have souls, it's to claim that they don't have innards, that they lack the kind of complex interior depths observable in the behaviour of Colin Firth or Judy Dench, and somewhat less evident in the case of Mel Gibson 
or say anything. <laughs> the special case here I always feel about Donald Trump is very rather difficult to say whether Donald Trump is actually a person at all. Well, because of an enigmatic ontological status. Uh, he's clearly some kind of creature. I didn't a doubt about that. But maybe one would need to call the zoologists in to establish exactly what kind of is. Um, but it's important, isn't it, to recognize that if Colin Firth has uh, complex interior debts, it's by virtue of his participation in a set of social and material forms of life. It's not that he's able to participate in those forms of life in the first place because he has given complex debts. He has complex debts because of his participation in a language, a culture, a form of life, and so on. Um, mind or consciousness, reifying terms as they are, uh, just is such a form of participation, such a dialogue between bodies. It's not something one can achieve all on one's own any more than one can play basketball all on one's own. How do I know that what I'm feeling is fear rather than envy? It would be enough to say that if I belong to a language which provides me with the concepts by which I can discriminate between the two different states. I couldn't do that simply by looking inside myself. Um, the idea that I could spontaneously or intuitively know that what I was feeling was fury is surely mistaken. An infant cries because it's wet or hungry, but it doesn't know that wetness is what it's feeling. Why not? It would be enough to say it's an infant, a speechless one. Nor for that matter does an adult know that he or she is wet, hungry, or in pain, because as Wittgenstein again points out, our relationship to our sensations, to our experience, is not one of knowledge. Yes. Nevertheless, an adult can reflect that what he or she was or is feeling is pain or dampness or jealousy as an infant can't, and this is because the adult is a body that has become articulate by being incorporated into the culture. Human beings are bits of articulate matter. Wittgenstein used to profess himself with a slight full naivete, I think, to be puzzled by the way in which other philosophers spoke about something called the external world, um, which he always professed he couldn't understand. I suppose what he might have had in mind was external to what? Um, certainly not to us. Uh, because we're fleshly incarnate creatures, we are in the world as surely as a tornado is, not peering at it contemplatively from some elusive location inside our skulls. The body itself is a mode of being pitched in the midst of a world, a point from which a world is provisionally organized and then reorganized, a medium of signification, a project or form of praxis, a perpetual traffic with our surroundings, a mode of agency, a form of communion or communication with others. Though the fact that we have language means that we're able to get closer to other people than actually by bodily contact. Sexual relationships are mostly about talking, or am I missing out on something? <laughs> um, it's this, all of this, you know, not the fact that it bears marks of gender or ethnicity or class that makes a human body what it is. And it's these properly universal and material features of it, because there's a materialist universalism, as the postmodernists lamentably forget, it's this that makes the postmodern culturalists so unreasonably nervous. A properly universal, material, what Marx would call species being, categories and aspects, dimensions of human activity. If we had had or had a su sufficiently subtle, as it were, phenomenological understanding of all that, of what bodies are, then maybe we wouldn't have needed this rather confusing soul language in the first place. It's because I think we didn't have 
maybe still don't have a sufficiently subtle phenomenological understanding of the body, uh, largely because of the influence of empiricism or mechanical materialism, that we needed to super add to it something called some invisible entity called soul. Those, I mean, who regard the body as being pretty much on the same level as a corpse, as being a lump of matter, are likely to feel the need to add to it some extra invisible entity if they're to make sense of how it's alive. Whereas if you had a sufficiently intricate understanding of matter, you perhaps wouldn't need that in the first place. Minds or souls of this kind are attempts to compensate for the crudities of mechanical materialism and are always at risk of being reified. Whereabouts in the body is the soul is a classic instance of such fetishism, as though one was speaking of the soul as some sort of ghostly liver or spectral kidney. It's a prime example of what Wittgenstein would call a confusion of language games, like wondering you know, how close to my left armpit is my envy. <laughs> um, so Aristotle, later for Aquinas, uh, the soul just is the specific life form of a material being, of a creature. It refers to the way, the unique, specific way that body is organized or self-organizing, activated, not activated by some principle distinct from it, but the way it activates, organizes itself. And in this sense, yes, to return to the question posed so tantalizing me in my title, yes, that is do have souls in this sense. <coughs> We simply wanted to know whether the answer was yes or no, and I'm free to leave. <laughs> there are membership forms for blonde on the way out, uh, and your very modest annual subscription of a mere five hundred dollars payable to yourself. <laughs> um, uh, even though the farmers whose cattle that is in fact uh, don't generally rank them among the higher spiritual beings, but yes, it's obvious that they do. The answer to the question, do batches of souls, is perfectly obvious. Just look at them. It's only because we have a mystified, obscurantist notion of the soul that we can pose such a ridiculous question in the first place. Does, does that have a soul? Obviously not. Just look at it. To claim that a human, a human body uh, is active, expressive, self-realizing, communicative, relational, world-producing, self-transcendent, and so on, it just is to say that it has, has a soul, though the possessive of another here is deeply misleading. I don't have a soul as I have a cell phone. I don't even have a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, who, for one thing, would be having a soul? Would I have to have another soul if I'm that in order to have my soul? <coughs> then my soul has my body and so on. If the soul is the form of the body, then it isn't anything I have any more than, say, the form of a poem is something I could you know, possess. Um, and neither is my body something that I have. My body is not my private property to be disposed of as I please, you know, as a certain kind of bourgeois liberalism would imagine. There may, there may be some sound reasons for abortion, I don't know, maybe, but that one is the sole proprietor of one's body to do with it what one wishes isn't one of them. Speaking of abortion, uh, every time I've been here in Notre Dame, I've noticed how there have been various vigils for aborted fetuses on campus, campus with utter silence about the thousands of children killed by the United States in Iraq, Afghanistan, and also there. Evidently, you know, the right to life doesn't seem to apply to them. It's true, as far as having one's body goes, it's true that we can speak currently of using your body, which makes it to that extent distinguishable from oneself, you know, as when I, I selflessly stretch my body in the mud to fall so that Tom Cruise may avoid getting his shoes dirty because he steps from Limousine. Um, you're supposed to love it, that. <laughs> um, but even if we can use our bodies, which we obviously can, we, you don't, one doesn't deploy them as an instrument from some point of 
proprietorship or manipulation from beyond them in the way that one can use a cup or a kettle. Um, what is present in one's body, one might, one might venture rather as the meaning is present in a word, not as somebody is present squatting in a tank, um, which is really a Cartesian image of the body. Um, one needs to note, perhaps, that that doesn't necessarily mean that one is luminously or transparently present any more than a meaning a signified is necessarily luminously and transparently present in a signifier. Um, the fact that we are desiring animals, for example, tends to hollow our bodies into ambiguity and equivocation, turn us into enigmatic texts of one kind or another. All the same, if an activity doesn't involve my body, it doesn't involve me. To speak to you on the phone is to be bodily present to you, but not physically present in the sense of sharing the same spatial coordinates. If heaven doesn't involve my body, then it doesn't involve me. Thomas Aquinas certainly believed in disembodied souls, um, but he wouldn't have believed, say, the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson was Michael Jackson. He was certainly to reject the idea that Michael Jackson's soul was Michael Jackson. The Christian belief is not, of course, in the immortality of the soul, but in the resurrection of the body. Wittgenstein also famously remarks in investigations that if a lion could speak, we would not be able to understand what he said. Why not? Couldn't we get hold of the translator? You know, some brainy colleague fluent in lionese. How about earphones, maybe? Not for Wittgenstein. Um, for him, rightly or wrongly, a lion's body and consequently its material life form is just too different from ours for dialogue between us to be possible. It's a quasi Nietzsche idea, actually. Um, Though it's highly doubtful that Wittgenstein, who disliked philosophy intensely and spent most of his time watching third-rate movies and reading second-rate detective novels, um, <laughs> had read Nietzsche or maybe even heard of it at all. Um, uh, one of the maybe the greatest English language philosophers of the 20th century, or indeed of modernity, who had a deep contempt for philosophy and constantly urged his pupils to give it up and do something useful for a change. Nietzsche, who is a materialist in his own idiosyncratic style, sees that consciousness is shaped by the kind of practical animals we are, or as Wittgenstein puts it in his work on certainty, it's what we do that lies at the bottom of our language games. It's what we do that lies at the bottom of our language games. Not um, an easy point, because of course what we do goes on within language in the first case. The first place we wouldn't call a human action, something that did in some sense in body significance. Um, two hands meeting uh, is not a handshake unless it goes on a certain cultural frame of reference. Aquinas was another who believed that the way that, uh, that we think, the way we do roughly because of the kind of bodies we have, because we're sensory creatures, he thought for that reason, interestingly, that the best kind of language to use was metaphor, because metaphor is tangible concretization. He thought that was most suitable to human beings, to the bodily beings all the way through for Aquinas. Um, because we're sensory beings, for creatures for Aquinas are material existence is discursive in the sense of unfolding in time, discursive in that sense of the word, and so therefore is our thought and language. We experience the word, the world, discursively, so Aquinas thought, our thought categories and our linguistic ones reflect that. The mode of knowledge of angels, by contrast, is traditionally thought to be intuitive and non-discursive. If an angel could speak, we would not be able to understand what is said. Because of their shared corporeal nature, uh, two people who can't speak each other's language um, can nevertheless cooperate, of course, in all kinds of things. They can all, they can pull somebody who's drowning out of the river, for example. Right? Um, this is because they share certain tacit understandings by virtue of their common anthropological life. 
There are certain, as it were, tacit understandings, later to be explicated or in principle explicatable by language, which are already, as it were, built into their sensory or creaturely forms of common existence. Whereas it's much harder to cooperate with a squirrel in pulling somebody out of the river. You just you know, look silly. You know. <laughs> Don't try to do that. Um, a certain translatability is, in a sense, founded in a universal nature of the species, phrases that cause postmodernist <coughs> uh, culture. Um, in our Gattungswesen or species being, which I suppose is Marx's materialist version of ground human nature. To be human is to belong to a particular species by virtue of the kind of body one has, which is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of becoming a person. Being a person is something one has to achieve, is something one has to work for. I mean, Freud is to be credited, most of us, you know, make a botch of it in one way or another. It's a project that we need to get good at, like you know, playing the trombone or tolerating wars at sherry parties. <laughs> and there are those who never quite get the hang of it. Well, again, if Freud is to be credited, um, none of us uh, really gets the hang of it entirely, um, but there are, there are degrees. There are those who are extraordinarily proficient at being persons, you know, the Tiger Woods or the Pavarotti's of personhood, uh, which who we call the saints. And that's the only time the phrase Tiger Woods and saints has been used in the same sentence. <laughs> Unless one of those faces around the cradle speaks to the infant, it won't become a person, though of course it will remain human by virtue of its material constitution. A small child who is yet to acquire speech reaches out to grab a toy and the gesture itself is inherently meaningful. It belongs on my play to a level of somatic or pre-linguistic signification inscribed in our very flesh, the word made flesh, as it were. The meaning is implicit in the action as the lining is in a sleeve, even though the infant has yet to acquire the linguistic resources which might enable it to be self interpreting to know the meaning of its action. But it's not even so just a question of the meaning of the spectator here. Any theory of meaning <coughs> or interpretation which doesn't begin from this point, I think, is bound to court the dangers of idealism. It doesn't seem meaning is in some sense rooted in the body, rooted in what we do, which is, in short, a materialist theory. We need, in other words, to recapture the truth that human rationality is an animal rationality. Reason is not when we're the least animal, you know, as in, oh, you terrible beast, and so on, but where we're most so. Um, a rationality which doesn't, isn't grounded in our sensory life is not simply an incomplete form of reason, it's not an authentic form of reason at all. A rationality which is unhinged from the sensory constraint of the body is a kind of madness, as King Lear discovers to his cost. One traditional name for this kind of rationality, one as it were founded in the flesh, is of all esoteric things the aesthetic, which first sees the light of day in the mid 18th century, not as a language about art, it comes that later, but as a language about sensation, as the Greek etymology of the word suggests perception, feeling. It represents an attempt on the part of a perilously abstract enlightenment reason to address what one might call the logic of the senses, incorporating the vital, if inferior, business of sensory existence into the lofty domain of reason itself, and thus smuggling the body back into a form of rationality which is in danger of expanding it. And if that project was so vital, it was, among other things, for urgent political reasons. From Plato onwards, we you know, or the cliché, talk of the relation between reason and the senses is always in some oblique fashion, talk of the relation between men and women, or between the rulers and the masses. If the dominant mode of reason fails to grasp from the inside, 
the sensory existence of those over whom it holds sovereignty, it will fail to be hegemonic, it will fail to be consensual, it will fail to rally the people to its standard, it will fail to engage their love and affections, and therefore authority itself will turn out to have feet of clay. Authority itself is unlikely to last very long. Um, it will then need to resort to coercion, and in doing so will suffer a massive loss of ideological credibility. For Schiller, for Arnold, for a good many others, reason must therefore install itself, as it were, secretly within the senses, shaping them from within, like a kind of fifth columnist, um, within the unruly and potentially anarchic ranks of the senses. And art is a very good example, a little model of how this is to work. There is therefore a rather, as it were, conservative dimension to this whole project of reason infiltrating the senses, but there's a utopian one at the same time. It's a deeply contradictory project. The aesthetic doesn't give up on the universality of reason, unlike some of the more militant bands of romantic or postmodern particularism. Instead, it seeks to redefine, to reformulate the relations between the universal and the particular, the totality and its constituent parts, whether you're speaking of a whole society or whether you're speaking of the artifact. What it produces is nothing less than a revolutionary new notion of totality in which there is indeed a law or principle or structure of the whole. You haven't simply surrendered to a kind of atavism or fragmentation, but the law or principle or structure of the whole is nothing more and the complex interrelations of its constituent parts. And surprisingly, it seems a long way away from that, just as Marx has in mind when he remarks in the Communist Manifesto that the Communist order will foster what he calls the free development of each in terms of the free development of all. Free realization or development of each in terms of in and through the free realization of all. That might almost be a description of the redefinition of the work of art. The work of art steers a judicious course between being a mere mob of particulars, on the one hand, and rigorously subjecting each of its features to some monolithic reason, on the other. As such, it becomes a kind of idealized image of a cooperative commonwealth <coughs> in which each constituent or part is self determining but self-determining on the basis of its relationship to all the other self-determining parts. The image is inseparably political and aesthetic. It's thus, for example, that socialism differs from liberalism and the aesthetic from some mere fragmentary or monological kind of language. Friedrich Schlegel speaks of poetry as what he calls Republican speech, in which all the various features he says, my free citizens have, have, as it were, the right to vote. The commodity form, so Marx argues in his disgracefully precocious economic and philosophical manuscripts, commodity form is in, indifferent to the material properties of an object, and in that sense, Marx plunders men and women of their sensuous richness. So too does what Marx calls abstract labor, so too the same goes for bourgeois democracy, in which individual citizens are abstractly equal and exchangeable in the voting booth, but grotesquely unequal and not exchangeable in social and economic life. If we wish to experience our bodies again, then, Marx is arguing, we have to do away with commodity production. It was this, no doubt, that Bertolt Brecht had in mind when he remarked that he wanted a society in which thinking could become, he said, a real sensual pleasure, in which thinking was no longer purely abstract, instrumental, utilitarian, at the beck and call of power or of profit. So the aesthetic emerges, strangely, uh, at the very heart of the Enlightenment as a form of rationality, a curious uh, form of rationality, but was stringent in its own way as the philosopher's logic, yet it's a form of reasoning otherwise, one which works in and through 
its own fleshly instantiations or sensory incarnations, and but is at war with some more reified or abstract brand of reason. Moreover, if the work of art is that which, like God, carries its ends, grounds, origins, raison d'etre, entirely within itself, and almost all aesthetic language is displaced the origin of one kind or another, if the work of art is now being redefined in this astonishing way, then it's a form of praxis in the sense of, in a lot of special sense, of those kinds of activities which carry whose goods are internal to them, which Alistair McIntyre has developed so brilliantly as an idea, whose goods are inseparable from their tangible performance and self enactment So that the end is not to be seen as lying outside itself, and to that extent, uh, the work of art represents a powerful critique, just by virtue of what it is, not necessarily by what it says, of the prevailing instrumental reason. Like virtue, in a certain classical Aristotelian lineage, its ends and principles are internal to it, which is not, of course, to say it's at least socially useless. Its reward, if one can speak in such crassly utilitarian terms, is its own perpetual self-delight. And as such, it offers a startling paradigm in a certain radical romantic tradition of how men and women could themselves be under transformed political conditions, where rather from being utilized as tools of power or profit, they were able to realize their powers and capacities simply as self-delighting ends in themselves. This, more or less, is the ethics of Karl Marx as it is of Oscar Wilde, who, who of course was a socialist and who are very close indeed in that respect. Where art was, there shall humanity be, to adapt a phrase of Freud's. There are various forms of practice that we engage in for their own sake, or to use a more technical <coughs> theological term, for the head of it, um, as opposed to those more tediously utilitarian practices such as flossing one's teeth or clearing ice from the windscreen, which we engage in just because we have to. These kinds of activities, art, love, humor, sexuality, music, laughter, joking, conversation, giving birth, drinking yourself under the table, collecting insanely expensive porcelain horses and so on, are generally the most precious of human activity. Most people agree on that thing. It's fair of thought for it. Um, all of them involve some form of instrumental rationality, which is not to demonize. You know, there could be no political life, there could be no social life without some form of instrumental rationality. It's just that activities of these kinds subordinate the instrumental to a different conception of human action, which is summarizing with the word praxis, that which carries its ends and goods internally within itself. Bringing up children, for example, is pretty pointless. It has no particular point. I mean, why, why do we bring up children? I mean, why do we have them? I mean, I mean, they don't, they're not particularly useful. They don't work. <laughs> they don't do anything, they just hang around the place all day, you know, <laughs> annoying you or whatever it happens to be. It's very hard to say what children are for. It's extremely difficult to say what they're for. Um, and the fact that they seem bereft of all the rest on death were maybe one reason why Victorians regarded them either as angelic or demonic, both evil and Satan as being essentially non utilitarian phenomena. The evil like to see themselves on terms in the sense, because they too, in their own converted way, are metaphysicians. They're superior to the uh, moral middle classes like ourselves. You know. So it comes as no surprise that Oscar Wilde was so fond of children. His children, of course, were taken away from him for good after the trial, um, and penned various covertly revolutionary tracts known as children's stories, since at a decade of East Seat, he relished things that have no obvious point by the children. What allows the body to be at its finest then, to return to what I was saying before, is not the suspension of practice as a certain kind of contemplative or non-utilitarian 
or aestheticist thinker or imaginist, not the suspension of practice in the core in itself, but the suspension of certain forms of practice of an instrumental or cause and effect kind. And for a long time, Foucault de Muir, one might say, art has been one name for the self-grounding, self-constituting, self-validating form of activity, and virtue has been another. Indeed, a cynic might consider that modern, in modern civilization, virtue would better be its own reward because it's unlikely to receive any other. There is an honorable doctrine, like Henry Fielding and Tom Jones, that the good will obtain their reward in this world, a doctrine he has which has only one defect, namely, it is not true. <laughs> it's a very disquieting thought, isn't it, that one of the few places in modernity where the virtuous are showered with gifts and the vicious are packed off empty-handed is that surrogate form of providence that we call the novel, that we call the realist novel, the modern form of providence. Uh, if we're reliant for our fiction for justice, then we're in dire straits indeed. We don't normally, I suppose, think of making love or art as reasonable, uh, because we're too dominated by uh, a reified notion of rationality. So we might well think of these activities as the very opposite of reason. But there's a case to be made, a good Aristotelian or Thomist or Wittgenstein case, I suppose, that such activities represent reason in its deepest and most subtle forms. It's also true to be sure, and this is the other pole that one has to hang on to, that reason, though it goes a long way down in that respect, doesn't go all the way down. Uh, there are rationalists for whom human experience is essentially reducible to reason, and there are skeptics or fideists for whom reason and experience or reason and feeling or reason and faith are fundamentally at odds. But think of the relations here between reason and love. Love is neither reducible to reason nor independent of it. Unless you can provide some reasons why you love somebody, it's hard to see how you yourself could know that you did. One must always be able to come up with some rationally cogent descriptions of one's love object in this respect. You know, that gives you some plausible idea of why you love him or her. But, you know, she has an enormous amount of money, for example. <laughs> she's remarkably tolerant of shiftless and indolent men like yourself. Uh, but she makes Kate Winslet look like John McCain. You have to provide some sort of rationales, but it's possible, of course, for a third person to feel that all the force of all of these reasons are not to love her himself. You know, reason is not wall to wall. It doesn't go all the way down, but it's just that without it, we perish. Let me end just by saying this. Um, because the human body is self-transformative, which is to say, it's always capable of making something of what makes it. It's always capable of projecting itself beyond its current situation, which is to say, again, it's historical, it's a historical body, as Hoover's and Hatstand's aren't, because though they shape their share in the process of time, they're not self-creating, they don't create their own history. Because of all that, Human beings are always capable of overreaching themselves uh, in a hubristic fashion, as the Greeks understood, and bringing themselves to nothing. Because we're linguistic or conceptual bodies, we can do all kinds of posh and intricate things that <coughs> badgers can't do. We can manufacture cruise missiles, for example, uh, and eventually blow ourselves up. And these rare and precious achievements are beyond power of badges, you know, united little beasts that they are. <laughs> um, they can't aspire to this august status, unless, of course, they are actually manufacturing cruise missiles and being very furtive. <laughs> um, their existence, because it's primarily determined by their biological species being, by their instincts, by their sensory inputs and so on, their existence is safe, but 
trifle boring. You know, I don't want to be odious with the tones here, to matches. From the inside, their lines might be enthralling and exhilarating. But from the outside, they don't look that much fun. Um, whereas human existence is enthralling, uh, can be, but sickeningly precarious, precisely because we can no longer, having created something called civilization, rely upon our sensory inhibitions or instincts to stop us, for example, you know, tearing each other to pieces. Because we have language and culture, and badgers are cultureless as well as languageless, we can create things that are no, no longer responsive to our sensory or instinctual bodily control, guns, for example, which I think Americans might just have heard of. Um, it's hard to strangle somebody with your bare hands, as I can attest. <laughs> Don't let us go beyond these four walls. Um, because you'd probably just be sick, you know, as the intra, as the inhibitions on intraspecific killing you know, kicked in. But although um, being, having somebody being sick of you is unpleasant, it's not hard as unpleasant as being strangled. Um, but if you use a gun, you can simply override those inhibitions, those center inhibitions. The body can create forms of technology, take all technology is simply an extension of the body, as all civilization is, which return to faith, which in the classical alienation slip from its control, assume enigmatic and alien form, and dominated as such some inexorable logic from outside. This move up, then, from, uh, from if you like, nature and the body and instinct to be able to rely upon all that to history, and technology. Um, this, this, this is, of course, known uh, theologically um, as the fall. This move up is known as the fall. All the best falls, of course, are falls up and not falls down. It's the fall up into history and practice and guilt and debt and so on, uh, not down to the beast. They're fine, you know, um, they're innocent. So, two cheers for badges. Thank you. Thank you. some of the leftist criticisms of Wittgenstein, which are essentially that he opens the way to cultural relativism. I don't think that necessarily follows, because Wittgenstein thinks that part of our forms of life uh, are certain relatively constant anthropological <coughs> as I was talking about. Uh, so I don't think that. Um, also, the left sometimes mistakenly thinks that when Wittgenstein, as it were, endorses forms of life, in a sense, forms of life for him are the foundation, or as the, you good Americans would say, the bottom line. Yeah. Um, some, some people on the political left think that he's um, complacently endorsing, you know, say, American or British civilization. But I think that's to mistake what he means by forms of life. He doesn't mean, for example, the present form of life in the States or in Spain. He means something much deeper and more anthropological than that. You know, seeing time as moving forwards, you know, for part of a form of life, a handshake, or, you know. Um, and and um, it's an interesting idea because in a sense, Wittgenstein is saying there is 
a, a kind of foundation for what we do. And to that extent, he rather alarms the anti-foundationalists. On the other hand, he's saying, but the foundation really is what we do. And that's a very shifting and changeable and various things. Um, so, after abandoning this I, kind of uh, conventional idea of what the soul is and saying that it's impossible for badgers to, to have this kind of soul that you talk about, would you say that, that it's possible for badgers or other animals to be moral, or are they still amoral? To be moral? Yes. Um, no, I don't think it is. Which is not, of course, to say that they're immor immoral. Far be it from me, is that you have to be pretty <laughs> secretly promiscuous or whatever. <laughs> uh, it's just that moral language doesn't apply to them, just as, of course, it doesn't apply to God. I don't think any theologian worth his or her salt would imagine that God is a moral being. Um, we need these strange discourses called moral philosophy or political science or whatever, there are many of them, because we have a desperate problem in knowing what we really desire, in knowing what our happiness would consist in. And we just have to internally keep talking about it. And one of the rather depressing features of that is it's highly likely we'll never come to agreement. Almost everybody agrees that we shouldn't, um, uh, we shouldn't torture babies, for example. There's hardly anybody who doesn't agree with that, but we can't agree on why we agree. And we probably never will. And that's quite an astonishing fact. So we need to talk it over and we need to develop certain discourses such as, which we call very same, including ethics or whatever. Um, we, we need these discourses because we don't know how to be happy. We can't, in other words, simply follow our instincts and our badger. Yes. <laughs> which is which is why badgers don't have morality, unless again they're keeping it. Um, uh, uh, morality, of course, ethics is about talking, for one thing, that is to talk, but they don't need it either, because so much is so much tedious spade work is accomplished for them by nature, whereas our much more ambiguous um, relation to nature means that we can't, you know, we can't rely on that to tell us what to do. Nor, incidentally, of course, can we rely upon the law in the mosaic sense, I don't mean in the, you know, the cops, but in the mosaic, to tell us what to do, because the law won't tell us what to do. It will simply tell us where we go wrong. That's one reason why for St. Paul the law is cursed. There are a number of reasons why it is. And Paul's ambiguous about the law anyway. But uh, one of the reasons why the law is cursed, and it won't, it won't, it's, no, it's useless to salvation, is because it will simply, in the manner of the Freudian superego, tick you off. It will simply make you feel small and diminished. It won't actually inspire you to be happy. Yes? Thank you. Um, Jack. Yes? Mm -hmm. I don't mean, I love you much, by the way, and so I don't want to sound like I'm being deductive when I'm not being. I'm going to ask a question that I'm just going to bet many other people are kind of wondering about. I thought your choice of badgers and lions but I do believe that I can cooperate with a dog and save a life. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's pretty convincing that whales have language. I've been persuaded that bees probably do have language. Um, I'm positive that I understand some things that dogs and cats say to me. Um, and there's been various descriptions their languages and unique combinations that they only put together in you know, human beings, cats and things. Um, so to say you can't, I mean, where does that line, uh, in your thinking, if badgers are outside of language that will posit that cats and whales have a language? Uh, this is just a very pragmatic yeah. question. Yeah. No, no, it's a fair enough. Um, I don't know where the line is. Um, it, it's a gradation, isn't it? I, I, I probably made it sound too absolute. Certainly, 
uh, uh, some of the other animals have sign systems and so on. Um, but they don't, to revert what I said at the end of my lecture, they, they don't have the kinds of abstract sign systems that would, for example, allow them either to blow themselves up or to write clearly. Whereas, whereas the human being is sacred, I mean, in the traditional sense of that word, meaning blessed and cursed, because they're all sacred traditional beings, because we can do both. As I say, where I come from, you have to take the kicks with the hapers. Yes. Um, Wittgenstein didn't like dogs. Um, <laughs> I, I know that. I know that because I, I had the great honor of uh, being present at his cottage that he used to flee to in the far west of Ireland in the most beautiful fjord like setting. Some years ago, when the president, the then president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, and myself, and a couple of other people came to unveil a plaque to, this, to, to him at this cottage. I spoke, to her, and the cottage was full. It was a sociologically unique occasion because it was full of Irish philosophers and local fishermen, <laughs> many of whom were Irish speakers. It's a game of that. And um, I asked some of the Irish, some of the fishermen, there were some elderly people who either they or their parents remembered him, and uh, what they, they, their memories were not altogether very affirmative, but positive. He spent a lot of his time telling them. Dogs, trying to get the dogs to shine. <laughs> and and Wittgenstein says he uses the image of the dog in the investigations where he says, very interestingly, and I think perhaps mistakenly, um, why is it that a dog can't hope for his master to return next Wednesday at 3.15? Maybe yours can. <laughs> um, and he replies quite correctly, it would be enough to say he doesn't have language. Concept the next Wednesday or three fifteen. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, as I point out in a scintillating, extremely cheap book to be published very soon uh, about, about hope, called Hope Without Optimism, um, there is another. Uh, there are less and less grand senses in which dogs can hope. Can they can hope for a bone to be thrown at them? Yes. But um, you need. It's a difference. I don't know where the, where the difference occurs, but it's the difference between kinds of science systems that are still fairly much tied to the body. Yes. Animals relate to their environment, other animals, sorry, relate to their environments primarily by their bodies. There's a certain amount of instrumentalities involved. Um, and the kind of language that can actually abstract you, either from good or ill, and this is why the fall is one reason why the fall is Felix Corpa, is a fortunate fall. It allows you to write King Lear. It also allows you to blow yourself up. The kind of language that can abstract you much further from your immediate environment. However clever your dog is, he just doesn't know. I don't care. No, no. However clever your dog is, he doesn't know what's going on in your eye. Yes. And that's not accidental. That's part of his species being. Please join us, we can continue talking at the reception upstairs.